Great, welcome everybody to the Markets and Network session of EC. Uh, and we're fortunate to have uh, Mohammed Akbarbador presenting the first talk, which is redistribution through uh, markets. Thank you. Uh, thanks, everyone, uh, uh, for, for being here. Uh, this is a joint work with Piotr de Worksak, uh, an, an old classmate at Stanford, and Scott Kaminer is a great friend. Uh, I learned a lot from these two people, and I'm reporting the results. So I'm going to jump into a very simple version of the model directly. Suppose you have a buyer-seller market. Uh, in, in, and, and in this market, there is one indivisible good. There is a unit mass of sellers and a unit mass of buyers. Now, each buyer or seller has a private value for this, this indivisible object. That's VI. And for the sake of this, let's assume it's uniformly drawn from 0, 1 interval. Now, buyers and sellers have the standard utility form. If I'm a buyer with value VI and I buy the object at price P, my utility is VI minus P. And same for sellers, P minus VI. Fine. So in this environment, if I ask you what is the social welfare maximizing mechanism, I'm sure you all know better than me. It's the competitive equilibrium mechanism. Set the competitive equilibrium price, which is a half in this case because of the uniform assumption. All sellers below the half would sell. All buyers above a half would buy. Market would clear exactly, and this maximizes welfare. So we are basically done with the talk. Uh, with, with, with one uh, caveat, which is that we are going to challenge uh, an innocent assumption of this slide, which is this assumption. By assuming this specific utility form, which is pretty common in mechanism design, we are essentially assuming that giving one unit of money to everyone in the society creates the same social value. So if I get $100 and give it to Bill Gates versus to Scott, it it's, doesn't matter for the mechanism. Okay, and we are not the first that are going to challenge this assumption. People in public finance and taxation have been challenging this assumption recently in some papers. And in fact, you can even use a standard economics to challenge this assumption. If you have a standard concave utility in consumption, you are going to have a concave utility in wealth. And then if your wealth is here, you are a poor person, your marginal value for one more dollar is more compared to when your wealth is there compared to when you are Bill Gates and you are to a first order approximation, you don't care about one more dollar. Okay, so in a society that people have different wealth levels, the marginal value of one more dollar for these people is different. Essentially, if I get $100 from Bill Gates, and this is dangerous to say, and give it to Scott, I'm increasing social welfare in this paper. Now, I'm not going to do that in a Robin Hood fashion. I'm going to take care of IC and IR constraint of Bill Gates and make sure he voluntarily do that in the mechanism. But that's the idea. So in the standard mechanism design environment, we are dealing with an economy of the middle, of the middle class. Everyone has more or less the same income. That's not, unfortunately, the case in the United States. So what happened to my picture? It's not here. Sorry. There was supposed to be a picture that this, this, this is not bringing. Anyways, that was supposed to be the wealth distribution of uh, of society. This system is not working as well as it should. Anyways, so if you have a society like the United States that the wealth of top 1% is more than the wealth of the low 50% or something like that, then uh, my, my mechanism designer can start thinking about valuing more, giving money to Scott versus Bill Gates. And this is the question we're going to ask in this paper, that if I all of a sudden tell you that the distribution of wealth of your sellers for example, you have a market that all of your sellers are from the low 50% of income distribution, and all of your buyers are from the high 50% of the income distribution. How does this information affect your optimal design? Okay, so let's, let's take this simple example, which is an extreme example, and incorporate it in our simple model. I'm going to assume that the marginal value of money for my sellers is m times more than the marginal value of money for my buyers. So my sellers have this utility form. Okay, this is a very simple way to think about this for now. This means, essentially, that if I give $1 to all of my sellers in this market, I'm increasing social welfare by m. Whereas if I give $1 to all of my buyers, I'm increasing social welfare by 1. Now, if you solve for competitive equilibrium in this environment, uh, None of my pictures are for some reason show up. This is not good. I don't know what's happening here. Uh, let me do something else. Sorry, this is weird. 
was working two minutes ago. No, it's here. It's here. And then I have presentations. I don't know why this is not working, but anyways. So let's go to this. Sorry, I lost one minute. That's fine. It's better to have pictures and lose one minute. Anyways, this would be the new competitive equilibrium. This would be my competitive equilibrium price. So as M increases, the competitive equilibrium price goes down, which is telling me that as my sellers become more and more desperate to have money, they are willing to sell at lower prices. The competitive equilibrium price goes down. And this is, in some sense, a paradox, because when my sellers are poor and value money more, I would like to give them more money from a social perspective. Market mechanism is doing exactly the opposite. Okay. So the question is, can we do better than market mechanism? Let's start with a simple example, which is, let's start with a simple mechanism, which is a very popular mechanism in practice. We want to regulate the price. Suppose I let you choose a regulated price between 0, which is the minimum price, and 1 over m, which is the maximum price. At price 1 over m, all sellers would sell. Now, if you choose a price higher than the competitive equilibrium price, you would have a trade-off. On the one hand, you would have allocative inefficiency, because now you have more sellers than buyers. You have to ration in some way. And that, means, uh, and that means that by the time that the mechanism is done, you would have some valuable trade left on the table. On the other hand, those sellers who sell in this new price are going to receive more money. So you are increasing what I'm going to refer as distributional efficiency. Now, if you solve for this optimal trade-off and do the math, you would see that this is the optimal price. So again, on the x-axis, I have my notion of inequality, which is m. That's competitive equilibrium price. I have 1 over m, which is the maximum possible price. And this red thick curve is the optimal price. So, so long as inequality is not so high, I don't want to distort the market. The cost of distortion is more than the benefit of redistribution. But at some point, the inequality in my market is so high that I'm going to say enough is enough. I'm going to actually regulate the price and transfer some money to these poor people who are selling. Now, uh, you are all mechanism designers sitting here. You, you would say, this is such a simple mechanism. Can't you do better by some fancy mechanism design? So let's go one step further. I'm going to give you one more degree of freedom, which is I'm going to let you choose two prices, one for buyers, one for sellers. And then if you have some revenue generated by this mechanism, you are allowed to redistribute that revenue to whichever side of the market that you like. If you solve for this mechanism, then you would, you, would, you would figure out that the optimal mechanism in this, in, this, in this optimal pair of prices have the following form. Buyer's price is going to be the monopoly price, which is a half in this case. I'm going to charge buyers as much as I can to, to take as much surplus as I can from buyers. Seller's price is going to be 1 over 2M. And it's not random, despite the fact that it's less than price of competitive equilibrium market. The reason it's going to be 1 over 2M is that the mass of sellers that would sell at this price is exactly a half. And that's equal to the mass of buyers that would buy at that price. I'm not doing any rationing. The market is exactly clearing. But I'm generating substantial revenue from this mechanism. I'm going to transfer that revenue to all sellers, including those who do not trade, as a lump sum transfer. So this would be the transfer to sellers who do sell. Sellers who do not sell would just get the transfer T. Now, again, you, you might ask, uh, can't we do even better than this? For which the answer would be no. In this example, this is the optimal mechanism. So this paper is about uh, introducing a tractable framework, a tractable, I mean, framework to incorporate inequality into mechanism design. And as a first question, we are going to, OK, that two minutes is costly for me. As a, as a first question, uh, uh, I, I'm going to ask, uh, we are going to ask this question of how to design buyer-seller markets take, taking wealth inequality as given. I have markets like ride-sharing, 
housing rental market, market for surrogates, which is a growing market in the world. And of course, as an Iranian, I have to tell you that Iran is the only country in the world which has a legal market for kidneys. That's, that's also an application of this framework. Sellers are substantially poorer than buyers. I also have within side inequality within buyers and within sellers. sellers. Uh, economists who are sitting here are probably mad at me because I did not mention this assumption up to this point. We are going to rule out second welfare theorem. A global income redistribution is not an option in the table in this world uh, in an optimal fashion. It's not an option on the table, and uh, I, I leave it to your imagination to see why, but I remind you of the recent Republican tax bill uh, <laughs> if you are worried about it. Now, there is related literature. Let me skip because of that, those minutes I missed. In YouTube video, you can pause and watch it. So, <laughs> so, so there are two goods in my economy, uh, K and M. Uh, K is an indivisible good agents demand one unit of it. M is basically money. You can own as much as you like. There is a mass one of sellers, mass mu of buyers. There is a pair of value for each person. How much you value good K, how much you value money. There is a distribution, joint distribution for sellers and joint distribution for buyers. Values are private distribution, uh, private uh, information, but distributions are common knowledge. Now, what do I mean by these values? If you own XK units of good K and XM units of good M, then your utility is going to have this additive form. So I'm not doing anything with the standard quasi-linearity assumption. I'm just incorporating the fact that some people have different value for money. My mechanism designer is going to choose a mechanism, which is an allocation rule and transfers, to maximize social welfare in the utilitarian fashion. I would like to maximize the sum of all the utilities of participants in the market. Subject to four familiar constraints, incentive compatibility, voluntary participation. If I don't have this, it's very easy. I'm going to get all of the money of Bill Gates and give it to you who are sitting here. But Bill Gates is not going to come to my market without this. Uh, without this, this IR constraint. Market clearing, I cannot generate any good K and I cannot generate any money, budget balance. Now, if you look at this formulation from a single agent perspective, if I divide it by M, the utility of an agent would be R, which is the rate of substitution times XK uh, plus XM. And R is the only thing that my agent cares about. Okay? So if you multiply my utility by something or divide it by something, the behavior of an agent in the market would not change. Two agents with values 20 and 2 and 10 and 1 behave exactly the same in my market. And that's the only thing I can extract through my mechanism. Okay. Now, when I talk about that red formulation of values, I'm essentially talking about social value of giving more money to someone. Otherwise, from an agent's perspective, the only thing that matters is the rate of substitution. Now, this is a sad result because, I mean, I'm going to focus on direct mechanisms that you tell me what is your rate of substitution. We are back to the standard mechanism design environment. But there is a key difference here, which is this. If I go to Iran and ask two people, what is the minimum price you are willing to receive to sell your kidney? And one of them tells me five, the other one tells me 10. In the standard mechanism design, the interpretation is that the value of kidney for this guy is five, the value of kidney for that guy is 10. In our world, there is a new interpretation, which is that, statistically speaking, this guy is much more likely to be poor. Okay. So rate of substitution tells me something about your wealth, which I'm going to use to design the optimal mechanism. So the form of the optimal mechanism, uh, I won't show it to you. I will just tell you. It turns out to be very simple, despite the fact that the space is very complex. For buyers, I have two prices, a high price and a low price. They can buy at the high price with probability one, at low price with some rationing probability. Sellers have the same thing. A low price, they can sell with probability one, a high price that they can sell through rationing. And then if I generate any revenue, I'm going to redistribute it as a lump sum transfer to the side of the market with higher average value for money. So the key point about this theorem is this, that there are two tools that the optimal mechanism uses, price wedge and redistribution, plus price control and rationing. And these two tools are necessary and sufficient for optimality. So when I use each one of them, depends on the distribution FS and FB and how, how much inequality I have on each side of the market and so on. So these are the two main results of the paper. If you have cross-side inequality, if your sellers are poorer than buyers or vice versa, you only use price wedge and lump sum redistribution. 
if you have seller side inequality, high seller side inequality, within your sellers there is substantial inequality, you use rationing. And you never use rationing for buyers. Okay, that's ex ante surprising, ex post obvious. Market mechanism chooses for the richest buyers. Those buyers who come to your market are the richest buyers that you have in your market because they're gonna buy, so you cannot help poor buyers by rationing, whereas sellers who are willing to sell their kidneys at low prices, they are actually poorest sellers that you have in your environment. You can help them by rationing and setting prices different from CE price. Now, if you don't have access to lump sum redistribution, which is the case in some environments, then you can actually use rationing to address cross-site inequality as well. Otherwise, you never want to do rationing for cross-site inequality. So let me, uh, and these are all subject to some regularity conditions you can see in the paper. So let me conclude. Uh, we, have, we have all these uh, rent control, regulated prices, and so on and so forth. As economists, we, we, we are sometimes think of these as uh, wrong policies. It could be that these are optimal responses of market makers to wealth inequality that they face in their environment. How can we take this framework and think about policy in some practical application? Let's think about rent control. In rent control, we are trying to help buyers by regulating the price. Okay, buyers of this, this, this object in my market. This framework tells you that actually that's not necessarily optimal. These people you are helping are the richest of your buyers that you're helping. So one thing you can do is to, alternatively, you can do the following policy. You can give tax breaks to renters, finance it by property tax of the owners. This is essentially forcing these two people to face these two sides of the market, to face two different prices. And then you are doing the lump sum transfer through tax system. So if you can do that, this, essentially, this might be a better policy than rent control. And for kidney and surrogacy markets, you can think about regulated prices. And also, you can provide free health insurance for these people who are selling their body parts uh, through uh, increased prices from the buyer side. So I would like to close by mentioning that the, 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 key, the key new assumption here is that in a world with wealth inequality, willingness to pay is not equal to welfare. So jumping from s maximizing surplus to maximizing welfare uh, seems uh, there is a missing piece here. Surplus is not equal to welfare in a world with wealth inequality. You can incorporate this in a variety of mechanism design environments. I have some of them here, and we expect to see different results if you, if you think about this new world. And much remains to be done. Yes. Oh, uh, the, the characterization of the optimal mechanism uh, uses the continuum. Uh, in principle, the optimal mechanism could offer a menu of prices and lotteries to every rate of substitution. The reason we can do this is, is a Bayesian persuasion style of proof. We can, uh, we can reduce uncertainty at individual level uh, to determinism at the population level because of the infinite assumption that we have. So the characterization will not go through. So that's, 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 that's why we need the continuum, yeah. Any questions? Yes. So you see this uh, sort of discriminatory pricing to address inequality in certain retail markets like electricity in California. Uh, and it would be good to, to contrast your mechanism with these actually implemented programs that are tended to uh, address inequality. Mm -hmm. Have you thought about that at all? Not about this specific market. We thought about this through rent control mm -hmm. and Iranian yeah. kidneys, which is the other paper. I mean, uh, that's I recently got the data, but, uh, but not in electricity. That's, that's a good example. We should think about it. Thank you.